Hello and welcome to Change Talks, interviews that spread ideas. And today we have a very successful hypnotherapist who has worked his way up to have a very busy practice, but also has a host of products he sells on his website, including the Hypnotic Salesman and the very popular Secrets of Self-Hypnosis. Adam Eason is only interested in what works, and people can subscribe to his evidence-based podcasts and memberships where he delves deeper into the research into the applications of hypnosis. Anyone that wants to get a deeper understanding of how to work with clients using hypnosis should check out this interview and then go to adams-eason.com for information on his training and products. I hope you enjoy this interview. How did you first get into hypnotherapy? Um, um, okay, so originally um, I became involved in the field of hypnosis and hypnotherapy um, as a result of a skin disorder that I had. Um, I had chronic psoriasis as a younger man and a whole range of what I consider to be complex and uh, problematic issues that went with that. Um, so the way it affected how I felt about myself and the way that other kids would treat you and uh, and so on and so forth. Um, um, as a younger man then was uh, uh, pushed in the direction of more formalized kind of counseling which I found to be a fairly impotent process and right. um, in my sort of late teens, early twenties, when I was at university, I encountered and went to see a hypnotherapist, and I had a most uh, amazing, a seemingly miraculous experience, uh, yeah. and uh, had no psoriasis ever since. And I thought, wow, um, I'd like to learn a bit more about this. And I even paid the therapist to go and sit down with him and be part of. Uh, uh, pay for a session and actually just have a discussion with him about what he did and what went on and how it worked. Mm. Um, uh, to, to be quite honest, I don't think that um, that he was as good as probably the result would suggest, and, and, and <laughs> okay. offered up uh, 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 you know far inferior kinds of discussions and explanations that I was actually after. So um, um, I started exploring and went on, and, uh, and, and and that was it. That was my kind of. Uh, and, and, that was my introduction, and as a result, it's the reason that I'm so utterly biased about the field of hypnosis and hypnotherapy today. Absolutely, because you, you obviously do your training now, and you have a very active um, website with your blog and things like that. And um, yeah. throughout your throughout your time as a as a therapist, especially in the earlier stages, um, how was how was his, like the fa any failures or things that not that not going your way? That the way that you well, made you better as a therapist. Yeah, I mean, I mean we're 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 very honest and open um, um, with with everything that I do. To be quite honest, as far as some of the things that that we did, um, um, I started as a therapist quite quite young, and as a result, I struggled greatly in my younger years. Um, I was. Uh, 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 I was young, gangly, ginger-haired therapist um, who people sort of looked upon as potentially too young to be credible and without enough real life experience and I had a bit of a naivety about me and at the same time also I had no sense of business at all. I just had a kind of um, um, unassailable enthusiasm and, uh, and bias towards the work that I was doing mm. um, and working under those kinds of conditions helped, certainly helped me to be a lot more resilient um, um, in the early days, I also tended to lack the courage of my convictions a little bit with regards to how I worked with individuals. Um, certainly my, my initial um, hypnotherapy diploma training was, was completely inept. Um, um, it was run by a very lovely man and everything, but the, the depth of skill uh, that was missing from that qualification that I had um, um, it, it, it's a wonder that I that I had any clients in any modicum of success whatsoever. Um, certainly, in the days since then, as I've continued to learn and develop, um, um, I, 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 you know, I, I blush at the kind of things and the kind of ways in which I worked in those days. So, how long was has that process been for you? Um, About for fifteen what, years now. Fifteen years. Okay. And when you first started, it was it very much a case of when you were seeing the clients, you you had that air of um, lack of confidence or you try to fake well, it until you make it? I didn't, I didn't have, um, um, I didn't, ha I didn't lack confidence in, in the subject and within the, the intervention and with, within, you know, I was incredibly confident of, 
of hypnosis per se and of hypnotherapeutic intervention, you know, incredibly um, um, unassailable as far as my confidence in that was concerned. Um, not only due to my bias relating to and pertaining to the fact that I had experienced such incredible results, mm. but also due to, you know, the, the, the occasions whereby, you know, wonderful things would happen. Now, I'm a very firm believer, I think, you know, even people like George Esther Brooks and all kinds of yeah. earlier research in the subject um, um, has shown that when people develop a kind of congruence and a belief in, in, in the processes that they're using, certainly they tend to be proven to be a lot more efficacious. Yeah. So, so, so absolutely, that would, um, that, that would stand out a great deal. Um, um, yet, as a, as a person, as a, as a member of the human race, so to speak, I probably was, was fallible and probably lacking in some of the, the core skills that have developed over time, um, such as a, a depth of, probably a depth of understanding, a depth of knowledge. Um, um, I certainly was a million miles away from being erudite in any manner as far as the subject was concerned. And my belief in myself as a person was probably still waning at those times. Um, so, so, yeah, there was, a, there was a contrast of things going on in those days. Okay, brilliant. And like looking at um, how you work with clients now, uh, what are you typically looking for when working with a client in order to indicate the change work process that you would apply with a person? Well, um, of course, everybody is treated on their own merits. And, and essentially, as long as somebody is requesting some kind of help um, mm -hmm. and has a, has a moderately good um, um, level of education about what it is they want, within this process, yeah. um, that then that, that's usually enough for me. Now, what I would say at that time, however, um, um, as, as a hypnotherapist, which is firmly what I, what, what I title myself and my, my main line of employment, um, um, as a hypnotherapist, um, um, part of my job, of course, then comes through the, the psychoeducation of that client and ensuring that they have a willingness to engage in the process, you know. Um, um, there still perpetuates the, the myth of people thinking that, that hypnosis is going to be waving magic wands and people mm. sort of nod off, wake up and scream hallelujah and run out cured. Um, so of course we've got a, 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 a degree of education that we need to be doing as far as the client is concerned in order to ensure that they've got a willingness to engage in the process so they take some responsibility for the tasking and the additional consolidatory types of work that they do outside of the session. Yeah. So they have some level of motivation. Um, of course, I don't think they'd arrive if they were completely lacking in motivation, yet some people do think that uh, it, you know, hypnotherapy in particular is going to be done to them, it's going to be wielded at them, mm. rather than it being something that they need to, to, to be aware is collaborative, you know, and that there's a, an effective working therapeutic alliance existing between therapist and client, and they must be uh, uh, as self-motivated as possible. But of course, part of our job as therapist becomes to, to to help motivate them and drive and inspire them and, and, and role model the kind of processes and interaction that we want them to become aware of as well. Mm. Um, certainly, open-mindedness is incredibly useful and helpful. Um, um, but all of these things, I think, you know, we can we can judge the level that they're at when they first engage and first are, are seeking out therapy, yeah. and then look to enhance those kinds of things within our pre-education and also expectation you know we correct their expectation and maintain it and 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 build it and adhere to it in a number of different ways and is that is that over a uh, a period of what 10 sessions normally or a few sessions or is it different um, for each person i would say i would say typically i work with people on average four to six sessions yeah. um with 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 an orientation session prior to that, which is whereby the uh, the education occurs and exists. Um, um, I remember reading some crazy statistics once that um, uh, Sigmund Freud, on average, would see his clients um, 1,300 times. And I used to think, what a brilliant business model. You know, he'd see like four clients, four clients a year or something. He saw uh, it for years. Yeah, exactly, marvelous <laughs> stuff. Um, whereas James Braid, on average, used to see people 
um, um, four to six times uh, in order to experience some kind of what he would term as, as, as lengthy quality change. Yes. Um, um, and, and, and I think that seems, uh, I seem to have a, a, a similar level as far as that is concerned. Brilliant. And um, I read recently about you talking about your, uh, you running the London Marathon. And yeah, your, yeah, uh, yeah, I've done that a bunch of times. And you're doing it next year as well, I think? Yeah, next said. year. Well, next year it's sandwiched. Uh, next year I'm actually running Brighton, then London, and Milton Keynes Marathons, all in subsequent Sundays. So, Blimey. Uh, yeah, Brighton, London, Milton Keynes, three weeks back-to-back um, um, for charity. Um, and and absolutely, uh, because of my, my love of running, um, mm. I'm running... A lot of people uh, have, have, have sort of misnomer, I think, about hypnosis, that it is something whereby we need to be zonked out and yeah. zombied. And people don't really understand or get that notion of being able... You, you know, people think that hypnosis and self-hypnosis are just another flavour of relaxation when, you know, there, there's stacks of evidence to suggest that, in fact, hypnosis has... Has, has, has a huge amount of results to be had, mm. um, even when somebody is not relaxed. And I think some of the um, some of the, the the research that was conducted in the 1970s would actually have people cycling and running immediately prior to hypnosis sessions. So they they found it very difficult to physically relax, yet still were responsive to hypnosis. So. Um, Absolutely, as far as the mental game is concerned, there's a huge amount that, that, that I do and that I do with a lot of my clients because um, I also featured on a television program a number of years ago with Steve Cram and Sally Gunnell, um, UK Olympic uh, right. athletes, who um, 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 are helping people run marathons, uh, who had a number of issues. And so as a result, over the years, I've tended to attract, because I, I often write and talk about marathon running myself, mm. I tend to attract lots of runners, and there's, there's a huge array of different things that we do with them. Of course, there's, um, I, I'm very much an evidence-based hypnotherapist these days. Okay. And a lot of the kind of mental imagery techniques that are prevalent within cognitive behavioral therapy also lend themselves very nicely to sports hypnosis. And in particular, um, I'm running, you know, uh, uh, lots of kind of metaphoric uh, uh, imagery with regards to, I mean, I, I, I've written about it a bit in recent weeks, mm. but also things to do with enhancing concentration and focus, things to do with digging deep and overcoming certain challenges, things to do with increased recovery and 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 overcoming injury, um, things to do with motivation as well. You know, if you're training yeah. for a marathon, usually it's a 16-week prolonged period just just for your training schedule. And mm. then there's all the time before that as well. Um, and and when you're running London Marathon, it means that 16 weeks prior to that is, is the heart of winter here in the UK. You know, when you get out of bed in the morning, it's dark and it's rainy. And the only other people that are out there in the world are, are lunatics or people <laughs> walking dogs. And, so and, you have to avoid both while running. You've got to drag yourself out there and you're thinking, God, you know, I'd love to be stuck here in bed, snuggled up to my wife in the warm. Um, um, and so there's a number of techniques as well that need you to get out there on, or off of your backside and get doing it with some persistency and some consistency. Um, um, so, yeah, there's, there's an enormous amount that I do. Um, you know, certainly I write about it a great deal on my blog. Mm. Um, um, I don't know uh, if I'm allowed blatant plugs, but we're Absolutely. Just about to, uh, Why not? <laughs> just about to release um, a, a marathon, uh, a self 